So, we move to financial management 14. We just basically did section 6 3, which finished, and now we move on to, well, can anyone close that door because there's a noise coming out? 6, 4, and 6, 4 is simply term structure of interest rate. Okay, so you have basically two types of structure of interest rate. The one type of structure is called term structure, the other type is called risk. Structure of interest rates. What I've been discussing in all of the previous lecture, default risk, inflation risk, liquidity risk, okay, maturity risk or volatility risk, or we call it also interest rate risk, all of these risks, all I did was essentially explain the risk structure of interest rates. That was the previous lecture. Now, the current lecture is term structure of interest rates, which when we say term, it is simply standing short for term to maturity. Now, some people call it but it is not recognized, it's not widely known, but people sometimes just use it out of confusion. They simply call it maturity structure. And maturity structure is exactly the same as term structure, okay? It is exactly the same. So, we need to say now what is term structure of interest rate. In term structure of interest rate is basically, let's see how they have it over here, is simply the relationship between bond yields and maturity. That's it. It is simply how yields change with maturity. That's all the rest to it. And based on that, you have a yield curve. And yield curve is very simple, a graph or a chart of the maturity structure. All right, that's all there is, just a picture. So what's the graph look like? Well, let's try one of these green to just draw a very simple picture and it goes like this it's simply a graph on the one the horizontal you got maturity sometimes they draw the maturity linearly sometimes they draw it in logs let me kind of like show you what a log will look like one year two years okay and see how two doubles from one now the same distance one two four years okay and now you add the same distance and it becomes 
If you want to double again, I'm going to draw it here and write underneath 16 refers to this one. And if you want to finish off here, 32 years, okay? This is called a log, horizontal log scale. And we usually like to put in on the vertical, linear. Linear means 2%, 4%, now, if it is actually linear, this one's going to be 6. So here, you multiply by 2 to get the log scale. Here, you add with the same number, okay? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, okay? And then you draw a picture. And the picture would most commonly be something like this. Okay, and this thing will be, oh, okay, so when we say here 12, let me add, because I said it but didn't write it, this is the yield. Uh, it's actually the yield to maturity. Yield to maturity. Which is the yield that investors would get if they hold it to maturity. Let me write it out here again. YPM is yield to maturity, okay? So, we draw the yield on a linear scale, we draw the maturity on the log, and this is simply the yield to maturity. And it just shows you, for a one-year bond, the yield to maturity is 2%. For a two-year, it's about, I'm just picking a rough number of uh, six. For a four-year, it's gonna be about Eight and so on okay so this curve is called let me write it in green yield curve okay that's it that's what the yield curve is and yield curve can have different shapes different shapes So, let me see how I do this. I'll do it like this. Yield curve. I'm going to use the blue one here. And I'm going to say upward sloping. And we have two definitions. So we call this upward sloping yield curve. It's a yield curve which slopes upward. This is an upward slope. So what does upward slope mean? Upward means upward sloping yield curve is a yield curve where yields rise with maturity. As maturity increases, yields increase okay that's it that's an upward sloping yield curve okay then you have they call it okay let's do this here downward Downward sloping will be, and I'll draw it here, let's do upward sloping, uh, I'll try to do this, I'll put in red, number small one here, 
and I'm going to draw this here as 1. Now I'm going to draw with green, downward sloping, and downward sloping will be like this. I'm going to put in a number 2, and I'm going to put in here for you number 2. Representing 2 is downward sloping, which is a yield curve that slopes downward. To slope downward means that yields fall as maturity increases. That's all there is to it. Okay. The next one is called horizontal. So for horizontal will be just that. It's horizontal. Like that. And I'm going to put in the number here on the left. I'm going to put in for horizontal number three, number three. And they give us one other type of a yield curve called Humped. Medium terms are higher than the short term and long term. Let's write it out. Humped. And I'm going to do here number four. Medium term are higher. So, it early on rises and then it gets to fall. This little peak is called a hump. So it goes up and then it goes down for whatever reasons. That will be number four. Okay. Now, in different times, we got different yield curves. And different yield curves change over time. So today, you got a one yield curve. Next time, you got a similar yield curve, but it can go up, it can go down, it can change, it can get flatter, it can get steeper, and all the other things. And I can begin to explain all of those. Let's begin first with which is the most common. That's kind of like I'm just throwing a random number. 95% of the time, yield curves are upward sloping. And because it happens most of the time, usually or normally, we get an upward sloping yield curve. And people like to call it normal yield curve. Upward sloping is known, and I'm going to write it here in red, as normal. And that's a term. Everybody's using it, okay? When they say normal, they mean upward sloping, okay? We call it normal because it happens most of the time. Well, if upward is normal, then downward sloping will be abnormal. And they like to call it abnormal, but the most common that you'll be hearing on TV, financial media, newspapers, experts, everybody would like to call it Inverted. Inverted means the opposite of what it's supposed to be. So, inverted. Inverted yield curve. Okay, inverted yield curve. This means the opposite of the normal, which is the same as abnormal. Alright? 
And then for the horizontal, they like to call it with the good old English word flat, flat yield curve, flat. And actually, flat matches with humped. Flat is just horizontal, hump is, with a little bit of a bump in the middle, okay? So it's called flat and flat yield curve. Okay, now, I don't know, I remember, maybe we saw it, maybe we didn't see it. Anyway, uh, let's go on and do a little bit further into this whole thing. Then I'm going to move on the right side over here so I can be explaining some more stuff. We'll go here and draw a nice yield curve. You got maturity, you got yield to maturity, Okay, and now we define a brand new term, okay? And the new term is called yield spread. Yield spread. Uh, I don't know exactly where it's in the book, Probably not even in the book, okay? But I'm just teaching you good stuff, okay? It's just good stuff. Uh, maybe I saw it, maybe I didn't see it. I, I mean, I don't want to waste time on this, uh, meaning to find it in the book. It's probably not in there. So, what is a yield spread? A yield spread is the. Just focus here, and you know, you're going to worry about the textbook when you get home or during the break. Yield spread is simply the difference between a short-term yield and a long-term yield. So, you take a short-term yield, sometimes they like to pick the two-year yield, but many would easily, okay, let's, let's do it a little on the left here. Uh, but many would like to pick a one-year yield, okay? Well, I'm just saying there's a shorter term and a longer term, and there is a longer term here. So, what is the yield spread is the difference in yields between short term and long term. So here is the short term yield here is the long term yield now we draw horizontal line which must be parallel to the horizontal line and we draw in here this is the short term this is the long term and the difference is the and I'm gonna draw it in red is the yield spread okay and I'm going to define a, what's called yield dynamics. Yield dynamics is how the yield curve changes over time. And yield dynamics, uh, let me use now blue, you could have rising yield curve, rising yield curve. Rising yield curve. And a rising yield curve is simply yield curve where yields rise for all maturity. 
So, let's draw this on a picture. Maturity here, yield rises, 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 rises. For any maturity, the yield rises. So, I'm going to use now, okay, I can use now, look how I like the kids. Uh, rising yield curve, number one, number one. This one is number zero, which is basically mean the starting yield curve. So, if over time, Yields for each maturity rise, you call the yield curve rising yield curve. Okay? Now, if maturities fall, we call it falling. Falling yield curve, that will be number two. And a falling yield curve, every yield falls and you have number two, okay? Next one is called steepening, steepening. Yield curve is a yield curve that gets steeper. Now we need to define steep. Steep. And steepness is measured with the yield spread. So, steeper means rising yield spread. Okay? So, steepening yield curve is a yield curve where the yield spread rises. Okay? Here's one example of a rising yield spread. You start with the same one. I'm going to now, well, yeah, let me use blue color for steepening. And it, it rises, but it rises faster. Okay? So, you still have the yield curve rising, but it's also steepening because rising, because yield curve, yields go up. But as they go up, they Yield spread increases, okay? So it is both rising, but the long end rising faster than the short end. So when the long maturities rise faster than the short maturities, in other words, when the yield spread increases, you got a steepening yield curve, okay? And let's write it steepening yield curve. Uh, I'm going to use here number three on this end. And here it's going to be number three. And number four will be naturally blue color. We call it flattening. Flattening. Yield curve number four. And a flattening yield curve will respectively mean falling yield spread. Falling yield spread. And one example of a falling yield spread will be that yields <coughs> fall. Now, 
flattening yield curve for different reasons. Because the long term falls, or it may be flattening because the short term rises. Okay. Over the last maybe two, three years, the Fed has engineered a falling and flattening yield curve. Falling because yields, since, okay, the beginning of the global financial crisis, short-term yields have been falling and long-term yields have been falling. But it engineered flattening yield curve where the yield spread was actually shrinking. Right now, short-term yields are practically zero. Long-term yields are 2%. And the yield spread is barely or less than 2%. So what the Fed did is bring down the whole yield curve and flatten it. In other words, they were, the yield was falling, bringing it down and flattening at the same time. It is, and it's very interesting, they engineered the new term that uh, got revived from 40 or 50 years ago, and they just keep talking on TV and financial media all the time. They call it Operation Twist. Again, I'm teaching not because I'm just some weirdo who likes, you know, theoretical stuff. This is what central banks do today in the US, in China, in, U well, tr they're trying to do this, but not as much in Europe. In Europe, the ECB says, no way, we aren't doing this, okay? But the Fed, China, and a whole bunch of central banks are doing an Operation Twist. And now let's explain what Operation Twist means. Operation Twist means buying long-term bonds, buying long-term bonds. Well, they said that in an operation twist, they're going to be selling short-term bonds and buying long-term. So when you sell short-term bonds, you will push up the short-term interest. And when you buy long-term, you're going to push down the long interest. And an operation twist will do is actually twist the yield curve by making it Flatter. So, Operation Twist is a central banking policy to make the yield curve flatter, okay? Usually, usually associated making it fall and flat. And that's what Operation Twist, Operation Twist is essentially trying to bring down long-term interest rate in order to make the, low, the yield curve lower for whatever other monetary you know, policy reasons. To stimulate long-term borrowing, to stimulate long-term debt, to stimulate investment, uh, to make the government borrow at cheaper rates. We call this a brand new term. Well, this is an old term from 30, 40 years ago now, which they are rediscovering. It's called financial repression. Financial repression. So I'm switching over from the textbook stuff to the real world of what's happening today is in the last one, two, three, four years. And financial repression is artificially suppressing interest rates, meaning artificially bringing down the yield curve in order to lower the cost of borrowing to debtors. The biggest debtor in the world is the U.S. government. It has huge debts mountain of debts, you know, as big as the Himalayas, right? And a huge debt service, meaning interest payments. And if interest rates would rise, the U.S. government will quickly go bankrupt simply because the whole budget is not going to be enough to pay the interest. And the only way for the government to survive this mountain of debt 
is to keep interest rates artificially low, both on the short end and on the long run. And financial repression is artificially suppressing is a policy of the government where the government artificially suppresses interest rates, okay, to keep them artificially low in order to keep the government payments, interest payments on debt artificially low. But how is repression different from twist? Twist relates to yield curve. Financial repression, uh, repression relates to all investments in the economy. In financial repression, you do not allow investors to make better, more, higher yielding investments. In other words, before you could invest in government bonds in two, five, sorry, 5%, now you want to buy a government bond, it pays 2%. What is it you and me say as investors? Hey, I'm not going to be buying American bonds. I'm going to go and buy, uh, I don't know, some other bonds, uh, British bonds or some other German bonds or something else. Well, in financial repression, you can't easily buy foreign bonds, okay? In financial repression, say, oh, yields and returns in the United States are so terribly low, I'm going to move my money to Canada or Australia or some other country like Bulgaria or better yet, Vietnam, right? So you're going to make a lot higher, better returns in some other country. Well, in financial repression, they don't only keep the yields oh, low, but they also keep capital from moving abroad. So they have what's called capital controls. You can't just move your money from the U.S. to Vietnam if you want to do that, or Bangkok to, you know, to Thailand or some other better yielding economy in country, like my home country of Bulgaria, okay? You can't just do that. So financial repression is not simply twisting down long-term yields, but also keeping capital captive or locked in the bond market, all right? Well, you'd say, but they're gonna run into stocks and say, well, they're gonna run into stocks if stocks are perceived to be safe. But if the stock market volatility suddenly rises and people get scared of the stock market, say, oh my God, you know, suddenly they're gonna keep their money out of the stock market and into bonds. Well, what about real estate? Well, real estate, if it's a good, profitable investment, you're going to move your money and, you know, hide out of the bonds, meaning staying out of the low yields into real estate. Well, the government policy in financial repression is to keep you out of stocks, maybe through higher risk, to keep you out of real estate, to keep you out of currencies through capital controls to keep you out of commodities. In other words, in financial repression, they have a policy to keep you out of alternative investments and keeping you to stay in low yielding bonds. Okay? So they use economic policy, financial policy, but they also use regulation. One type of regulation is they're going to say, commercial banks, you got to be buying more bonds now. You're required instead of 20% to buy 25%. All right? Well, is the government going to say like that? And the answer is no. They're not going to tell banks that they must invest more in bonds. They're going to tell the bank, oh, these are risky assets. You got to reduce your mortgage lending. Uh oh, if you got to reduce your mortgage lending, this means you got to increase something else, right? So banks aren't going to be lending so much for real estate and investors can't be borrowing to move to real estate. So if they got to shrink their mortgage loans, they got to invest in something else. Well, they're going to be investing more in bonds. Well, Regulation will restrict them into investing in foreign currencies because the government says, oh, foreign currencies are risky, okay? So, by government 
reducing the alternative investments of commercial and investment banks or pension funds and other institutions through regulation. They're going to say it's a high risk environment and commodities are risky. You must reduce your investments in risky assets like commodities. Okay? And then they say, oh, but you got to also reduce your investment, your risky investments in stocks. Well, they can't, some of them invest in stocks. Pension funds could. And you got to reduce your risky investments in currencies. Suddenly, as they got to reduce all the risky investment, the only thing that is left to invest in is bonds. And that's what financial repression is about, is essentially lowering or eliminating the possibility to move money out of the bond market and out of the country into alternative investments. And because of limited or no other choice, you got to just stay in bonds because there's nothing else to invest in, nothing else that is relatively safe. Okay? And that's financial repression and the real world of 2011. And they are already talking about financial repression. Okay? It is already in the media. They already mention it. It is, in a sense, semi-official policy, even though the government is not formally, legally, not officially saying that it's a financial repression. The economists and all the others are effectively saying that this is what is actually happening in order to keep the country from going bankrupt. In other words, in order to keep interest rates low. All right, let's see what else we got. The yield spread, and that's it, using yield curve to estimate future interest rates. Well, that's very simple. Let me switch over to Oh, okay, okay, six, five, okay, what determines the shape? So all I was telling you so far is the shape of the yield curve. So now section six, five, shape of the yield curve. This is what I've been doing for the last 40 minutes. And now we have determinants. Determinants of the shape. You know, what determines the shape? Okay? Page 164 from the Brigham book all the way to 167. So what determines the shape? Well, it's very simple. Risk-free interest rate. risk-free interest rate which is determined in a great extent by monetary policy savings investment opportunity the economy basically risk-free interest rates is determined by a lot of the stuff that I was talking about and the other piece is risk So, what you have, and I should probably write it over there, let me uh, draw a second picture over here. I will try to reconstruct, uh, let's try to reconstruct figure 6-5. Figure 6-5 on page 165. 
is basically you're going to have the risk-free interest rate and then you're going to have different premium and you're going to have let's say this is the risk-free rate you're going to have different type of risk premium so this will be that's right here inflation premium okay this will be default premium liquidity the premium so if you're making a 10-year investment you're going to have some risk-free return you're going to have liquidity for sorry premium for inflation for default for liquidity so what determines the shape of the yield curve is how risk premium change over time okay how risk premium change over time and different risk premium could be changing for example as the economy gets into a recession and times get hard default risk increases and liquidity risk increases but inflation risk typically goes down okay as economy gets growing and booming the risk-free interest rate increases because there is more demand for borrowing but inflation premium also increases okay so these components so components usually change because of the business cycle and components usually change because of monetary policy so you have the natural market forces associated with savings and investments determining the risk free rate they got the natural market forces of inflation and of all the risks and you have the forces of government which are monetary and fiscal policies that further affect all I was discussing here in Operation Twist and Financial Repression is how government, monetary, and in general economic financial policy affect the yield curve, but they also have additionally the market natural forces of risk. And this is good enough for this lecture, right? Is it 10:30?